Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by John Swinney on advance redress payments. The Deputy First Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. Uh, I call on John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary. Ten minutes, please. Presiding officer, last October I made a statement in Parliament committing to provide financial redress for victims and survivors of historic child abuse in care. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I made clear that we wholeheartedly accepted the need to provide acknowledgement and tangible recognition of the harm done to children who were abused in care in Scotland. We do so openly acknowledging that such recognition cannot in any way take away the pain that individuals have suffered. Since October, we have continued to hear harrowing evidence of the abuse of children in care settings across Scotland. We have listened to the testimonies given to the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry. Victims and survivors continue to tell us of their experiences of being failed by the establishments and people entrusted to look after them. We must continue to listen to that testimony and the Scottish Government will consider with great care the findings and recommendations that are made in due course by Lady Smith. Work has been progressing since my statement in October to design the statutory redress scheme. The Government remains committed to introducing a bill which can pass its final stages before the end of this parliamentary term in March 2021. I welcome the views and the encouragement of Members of Parliament that we should do all that we can to accelerate this timetable. My officials are working at pace to establish a statutory scheme as quickly as we can. I am conscious, however, that there is a significant amount of detailed design required to ensure that we get this right. We will have a full pre-legislative consultation later this year to hear a wide range of views in this process. We must be confident that we get all of the details correct in such a scheme. Presiding officer, we are all too aware that because of age or health, some survivors may not live long enough to apply to the statutory scheme. I'm pleased today to confirm the launch of an advance payment scheme for those who were abused as a child in care in Scotland and who have a terminal illness or are age 70 or over. The scheme is now open for applications and full details will be published online this afternoon. A telephone support line will open on Monday morning dedicated to helping survivors who wish to request an application pack or to find out more about the scheme. We realise that the application process itself may be distressing for some survivors and we will signpost applicants to sources of support should this be required. The advance payment scheme will be administered within the Scottish Government by specially trained caseworkers who will support applicants through the process in order that they access the acknowledgement that they rightly deserve. The advance payment will be an equal payment to all applicants who meet the eligibility criteria. It will be made using the Scottish Government's common law powers. The payments will be discretionary and made on an exgratia basis. The payment level has been set at £10,000. The sum is broadly in line with interim payments made by redress schemes in other parts of the world. The costs of the advance payment scheme are being met in whole by the Scottish Government and we intend it remains open for applications until the statutory redress scheme is established. Given the time-sensitive nature of advance payments, we have kept the application process as straightforward as possible. To be eligible, applicants must either have a terminal illness or, by, or be aged 70 or over and must have been abused in care in Scotland before December 2004. Whilst we are guided by the terms of reference the Government has set for the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry, this is not the sole influence in relation to eligibility. Given the differing, the differing purposes of redress and the inquiry, we have looked to other sources if those provide a better fit or to add interpretation to the inquiry's terms of reference where that is needed. Presiding officer, the systems we now have in place to regulate different aspects of childcare and to safeguard children from systemic abuse are radically different today than the, regi the regimes of yesteryear. It was this Parliament which introduced fundamental regulatory change in this area, establishing Disclosure Scotland, setting up the Care Inspectorate, requiring the registration of care staff across children's services and more. 
It is the prior historic failings which have led the government to establish a scheme of redress. December 2004 marked the public apology made by the then First Minister Jack McConnell and endorsed by the Scottish Parliament as a whole. It also marked the broad midpoint of a period of rapid and significant change in child protection legislation and policy and practice in relation to children in care. We have defined that date of December 2004 as the date prior to which abuse would have to have taken place to demonstrate eligibility. For the purposes of advanced payments, residential pupils at boarding schools will not be eligible if their parents chose that place for their children's education. We know from criminal cases that abuse did take place at some boarding schools and the impacts will have been as horrendous as abuse elsewhere. But the advanced payment scheme seeks to respond where institutions and bodies had responsibility for the long-term care of children in the place of the parent. Long-term health care eligibility will exclude establishments whose primary purpose was medical or surgical treatment. Patient stays in these hospitals, primarily general or local hospitals, will normally have been short to medium term and importantly, it will have been possible for parental contact to be maintained, albeit constrained by visiting arrangements. Children who stayed in all other establishments, whether the function was primarily care and not treatment, and the stays were often long term, indeed sometimes lifelong, will be included. Survivors asked us to develop an application process that is as straightforward as possible for survivors, whilst making the scheme robust and credible. This is what we have designed and today are delivering. Applicants will not be required to submit evidence of having been abused, but will require documentary evidence which shows they were in care. Terminal illness will need to be certified by a registered healthcare professional through a process which we believe is as sensitive as possible to the circumstances of the applicant. We know that some eligible applicants will not yet have the written documentation they need to support their application. Our caseworkers will be on hand to help and advise applicants and to refer them to organisations that can help them to obtain a supporting document. Recognising the impact that applying for and receiving an advance payment may have on survivors will also make applicants aware of organisations that offer emotional and other types of support. Presiding officer, there are no reliable estimates of how many survivors may be eligible for advance payments. We will prioritise applications from those who are terminally ill. We will keep our arrangements under review so that our processes and procedures adjust in the face of experience, reflecting feedback from applicants. I wish to take this opportunity to thank the Interaction Review Group for continuing to work closely with us towards this launch today. Their input to the design of the Advanced Payments Scheme and the application materials has been invaluable. We will work in a sensitive way, taking into account the trauma applicants will have experienced and I want to express my gratitude to all those survivors and organisations who have given us their advice and suggestions. I thank also colleagues who have designed and delivered redress schemes in other parts of the United Kingdom and indeed across the world, and who are giving so generously of their time to help us understand what lessons can be learned. Our next key step is to develop proposals for the statutory redress scheme. No decisions have yet been taken. In developing our proposals, we will take into consideration the views expressed in the survivor consultation last year, the responses that will come from the more detailed pre-legislation consultation later this year, and our experience of delivering advance payments. Presiding officer, this advance payment scheme is a significant milestone in our endeavours to do what we can to address the wrongs of the past. I hope it will provide some degree of recognition and acknowledgement for survivors who have waited the longest for acknowledgement and redress and those who have a terminal illness. I can reassure other survivors of historical abuse in care that our commitment to design the statutory scheme with a strong survivor voice is unrelenting and I commit to updating Parliament on a regular basis 
on the progress that we are able to make. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Deputy Presiding, De Deputy Presiding Officer, Deputy First Minister, demoting you. Uh, we'll now take questions on the issues raised in the statement, and I intend to allow about 20 minutes for questions. Can I ask members who wish to ask a question? Press the request to speak, but now I call Liz Smith, be followed by Ian Gray. Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of his statement, and can I also commend the Scottish Government uh, very strongly for the manner in which they have undertaken what must be very challenging and sensitive work. And uh, we also put on record the Conservative Party's thanks not only to the Scottish Government, but to all the people who've been involved in this. And can I strongly um, welcome the advance uh, payment scheme. I think this will be uh, very helpful to uh, allay some of the concerns of those that we heard from in the early stages. Uh, could I just ask one question, uh, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, you mentioned the um, measures that are being undertaken to ensure that there are very specialist um, care case workers uh, on hand to deal with these concerns. Should it prove necessary to expand that role and to maybe increase the number, uh, has the Scottish Government made provision for that? President Deputy First Minister. President Officer, can I thank Liz Smith for her generous remarks in relation to uh, the announcements I have made today. These are very difficult issues and they require the engagement of individuals who have suffered uh, horrendously and I'm very grateful to them for their input. They've helped us enormously in reaching the point that we have reached today. Uh, I'm acutely aware of the fact that the pr even the process of applying for this assistance will be traumatic for individuals involved, which is why we've taken care to train the individuals who will be providing the advice and support uh, which will be available from Monday and to ensure that individuals are supported in the making of an application because although the, um, the, the, the arrangements around this process are being kept to the, 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 the minimum level we can, there will still be some challenges for individuals around the availability of documentation and other points of information. So that support will be there and I will be regularly monitoring whether it is adequate to support the demands that are placed upon it. I should also reiterate the point that, of course, there are other sources of support available, principally through the Future Pathways activity and other interventions, which we will be signposting individuals to if they are not already in touch with many of these organisations. Thank you. Ian Gray, followed by Ross Graham. <clears throat> thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, thanks uh, also to the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. The Cabinet Secretary knows uh, that we have encouraged him to act quickly in creating an advanced payment scheme for survivors who are elderly or terminally ill. Uh, so, of course, we also welcome the opening of such a scheme uh, today, and it is welcome that the scheme is open as the announcement is made. We also welcome assurances that procedures are designed to be straightforward, sensitive uh, and quick. Uh, however, there are, as the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged, some contradictions between the remit of the scheme and the remit of the child abuse inquiry. So can I ask for some further clarity on a couple of points there? Firstly, the inquiry works to a cut-off date of 2014. So could Mr Swinney explain why he could not have simply uh, made the more consistent choice of 2014 for the scheme's cut-off rather than 10 years uh, earlier? And secondly, with regard to the exclusion of those abused in boarding schools, can he clarify if this is the same or different to the reach of the inquiry? And if it is different, why so? Deputy First Minister. Um, on, the, on, on the first point, I, I'm grateful to Mr Gray for his uh, remarks and uh, I appreciate the um, willingness to support the approach that we're taking. It's important, I think, that we try to make progress on this uh, across the political spectrum on this issue. In relation to the cut-off date, we selected 2004 uh, because of its significance in relation to the statement made by the then First Minister, Mr McConnell, at that time, and because this scheme is specifically targeted at older individuals and individuals with a terminal illness. And we believe that that, um, uh, that cut-off date is appropriate to ensure that all individuals that may fall into that category uh, will be um, able to uh, apply if the circumstances are relevant to them, uh, given that date. Obviously, um, 
I, I've indicated that in relation to the statutory redress scheme, no decisions have been taken on the points of eligibility there and the issues that Mr Gray raises I think are of a different character and more relevant perhaps to the statutory redress scheme upon which we will consult later this year. In relation to the point on boarding schools, the, the distinction that I am making here is where the decision was taken to place a young person in a boarding school was taken with parental engagement and involvement or where there was not parental engagement and involvement. And the reason for that is that the institutions would be, if for example a parental decision was not involved and a, a, a child was placed in a, a boarding school by um, an organisation expecting that boarding school to operate in local parentis, um, then the, there would be a different nature of the relationship between the child and the institution than if a parental decision had been involved. And that's the distinction that I'm making to try to ensure that we are properly focusing the, um, the scheme on the cases that require and merit the intervention that is suggested uh, by the details of the scheme that I'm putting forward. Our ten members wishing to ask questions, so we can have short questions. Please, Ross Greer, followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, like colleagues. I would like to put on record the Greens' thanks to the government and to the survivors' organisations who have delivered this progress. Many of those who will be eligible for the advance payment scheme will not be online, will not be involved in survivors' organisations, and many of them will have never previously disclosed their abuse. How will the Scottish Government ensure that awareness of the scheme is as wide as possible to ensure that exactly these people know that they can apply? Deputy First Minister. Uh, I, Mr. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Greer for his remarks and, and, and he raises a, a serious point in this respect. We are obviously using uh, a variety of means to communicate. The fact I've come to Parliament to make a statement to try to ensure there is as much um, awareness and scrutiny raised from the, the, from the significance of a parliamentary statement being made on this particular question. But we will also be um, activating uh, and have been working very closely with survivors groups to make sure there is the widest possible awareness through those networks into the bargain. Uh, we will separately be promoting through a wide variety of government channels of communication the, uh, the awareness of the scheme and obviously the, um, we will look to ensure that as many individuals as we possibly uh, can identify are able to uh, apply for the scheme. I think a question of this type in, in terms of being considered through a general marketing campaign is, I, I think, quite a challenging question because of the sensitivity of the nature of the issues involved. But I do want to make sure that we maximise the reach of the scheme and the involvement of individuals. And I do appreciate that this may well be the first time that individuals will think to consider to take steps in this area. And that is why we've put in place the briefing and support arrangements to try to make sure that if individuals take that courageous decision, they are well supported by us in the process. Tavi Scott, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Government is doing the right thing here, and I want to thank the Deputy First Minister for uh, the statement he's made to Parliament today and indeed the steps he's outlined to, uh, uh, to those who uh, we hope will directly benefit from uh, these announcements. Uh, I wonder if the Deputy First Minister could um, give some indication of how long he expects uh, the period to be for by which an applicant first makes the application or rather an application is first made and when a payment a first payment is expected and secondly um, will the government um, seek to claw back monies paid to victims from those who may be found to have actually been responsible or will the government um, simply pick up the entire tab Deputy First Minister. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Scott for his, his welcome of the announcements he made today on the first point I would hope that we would be able to make payments within a month of an individual making an application and that's the, 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 the timeline that we expect to operate to and of course obviously we'll monitor that very carefully to ensure that uh, we are able to uh, fulfil that. Um, in relation to the second point, the government is going to meet in full the costs of this scheme. Uh, I took that decision to ensure we could act with urgency uh, to address this. Obviously, in my earlier statement in October, I made it clear that I thought there was um, the necessity to consider with other organisations who were, who were running the institutions that um, uh, 
uh, were involved in uh, the abuse, uh, that there was a very strong case for contributions to be made to the statutory scheme, and I intend to pursue those discussions as part of that preparation. Fulton McGregor, followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you, President Officer. As Deputy Convener on the Adult Survivors Cross Party Group in this Parliament, and as a previous director of the Moira Anderson Foundation, I'd like to put on record um, my thanks to the, the Deputy First Minister and welcome the statement and the commitment, um, to, uh, the ongoing commitment in, in this area. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the Scottish Government has engaged with the responsible care providers and religious organisations following the publication of the review group's recommendations? Deputy First Minister. We, 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 much of that dialogue will essentially await the formulation of a statutory redress scheme where we will consider uh, some of those points in the dialogue and to follow up the points that I made to Mr Scott just a moment ago. Um, I've been very focused and I've asked my officials to be focused on ensuring that we make the swiftest progress in getting this announcement in place. Um, we had to await the passage of the budget bill to create the financial authority for us to be able to make such payments. Uh, that was secured for the government just shortly before the Easter recess. And I've come here in the first week that we've returned for after the Easter recess to ensure this announcement could be made at the earliest opportunity. But the issues that uh, Mr McGregor raises um, are issues that we will pursue as we develop the statutory scheme. Maurice Corey, followed by Gail Ross. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I too welcome today's announcement from the Cabinet Secretary. The statement says that applicants will be made aware of organisations offering emotional and other types of support. Considering the traumatic experiences of survivors, would the Cabinet Secretary commit to ensuring that that support will not only be offered at the initial point of contact, but that offers of support will go further and caseworkers will check in with survivors at a later date to ensure they have received the support they need? Deputy First Minister. There are a number of organisations who are operating under what I would call the umbrella of the Future Pathways approach, which have ongoing relationships with uh, survivors of uh, childhood uh, abuse. And uh, those, I'm conscious from listening to the experiences of those individuals who provide that support, um, at the, the need for that sustained engagement and dialogue to support individuals. Uh, so the point that Mr Corey makes is an important point that that uh, relationship is sustained, that individuals can have access to advice and support when they need it because in, in this whole area of activity it is difficult to predict the moments at which individuals will once again require to receive that type of support. So I give that assurance uh, to be the case. Gail Ross, followed by Joanne Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how survivors coming forward who are elderly or suffering from ill health will be supported through the application process? Deputy First Minister. We have recruited um, specific caseworkers who will be there and available to support individuals. Um, one of the examples I, I, I cited to Liz Smith earlier on is that there will be a, a need, a modest amount of need for some documentary information. And that may not be easy for individuals to obtain. So it's very important that individuals are properly supported. There are organisations that can help to provide that information, but that might not ordinarily be uh, within the knowledge of individuals who require it. So we will ensure that there is active and focused support for individuals to ensure that they are able, uh, particularly where there is greater vulnerability, and this scheme is aimed at individuals with greater vulnerability, that we can ensure that uh, they are properly supported through the process. Joanne Lamont, followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you very much. Um, I note and welcome the acknowledgement in the Cabinet Secretary's statement that the application process itself may be a distressing one for some survivors and has, as he already spoken about, ensuring that people may be directed to sources of support. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would also agree that the very fact of this discussion and a broader conversation around this process may also encourage others finally to disclose abuse. And I wonder how the Cabinet Secretary proposes to ensure that those groups who have a long and important record of supporting and campaigning for survivors of abuse, who may be outside the Future Pathways process, are given sufficient resources to meet this evident increase in need for their services. Um, Deputy First Minister. It, it is important that, uh, I think when I made the point about um, the 
uh, the nature of the relationships of support that are put in place to organise uh, to, to individuals. It is important that uh, we work with those organisations to sustain their activities. So uh, I'm conscious of the point that Joanne Lamont makes. What we what is impossible for us to predict here is what the reaction will be to the announcement that I have made in terms of the applications that will come forward and what that will trigger in individuals. It may trigger more individuals going to the, um, to the, to the inquiry that's been established and I would encourage anybody who's had this experience and wishes to raise their concerns with the inquiry to do exactly that. The strength of the inquiry is based on the testimony of individuals having the courage to offer that and I would encourage it. And obviously I would encourage individuals to come forward to make, um, uh, to, to, to make applications uh, to the scheme if they are eligible. But we certainly want to make sure that we support organisations to provide the advice upon which survivors depend for uh, their, their own uh, sustenance and support at critical times. Jenny Gilruth, followed by Alison Harris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain how the payments of advanced financial redress uh, will be issued to survivors and whether this will have any impact on pension credits or means-tested benefits? Deputy First Minister. Uh, my, my, ob my objective is to ensure that a payment received under this scheme has no effect on any other financial provision that an individual is receiving. We've had that assurance from the DWP we are in it, uh, although it applies for one year only, and, in and that's clearly set out in the, uh, in the information that's available to members of the public who apply. We are in advanced discussion with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to ensure that this is discounted for tax purposes, and um, we, I have no reason to believe that there will be an issue there, uh, but I didn't want to delay the announcement while I waited on the completion of those discussions. But my objective is to ensure that there is no, um, that this in no way um, affects or undermines any other financial support that's available to individuals. Um, and obviously the payment arrangements will be discussed directly between um, the uh, civil servants who are administering the scheme and the individual applicants uh, for the payment of the sums of money involved. I can I ask the last three questioners to be particularly brief? It's a very sensitive subject, but I want to get you all in. Alison Harris, followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary has made clear that the Scottish Government took considered advice from various parties before announcing the advance payment scheme, including advice from other countries. Is the Cabinet Secretary prepared to say which countries provided that helpful advice and how the, the total figure of 10,000 per head was arrived at? Deputy First Minister. We, we looked at particular advice and received advice from the Republic of Ireland um, from some of the provinces of Australia and also from some of the provinces in Canada. Uh, the figure of £10,000 um, was um, fairly consistent uh, but at the higher end of the comparative schemes that were available in other jurisdictions. Indeed, uh, on the interim payments uh, in the Republic of Ireland, Western Australia, Queensland and Nova Scotia, um, the figure of £10,000 is higher than those figures. So we, we've looked at um, a number of other jurisdictions that have taken forward such an approach and tried to set this at a level that we believe to be um, consistent and reasonable in that context. I, I accept that there is never a precise conclusion to be arrived at, but we've looked at the best judgment we could across jurisdictions. Rona Mackay, briefly, please. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm there are additional resources in place to provide financial, advanced financial redress to all applicants, should there be a greater number of applications than is expected? Deputy First Minister. The, the, the Government has made provision in the uh, budget for a, a, a total of £10 million to be available for the payment of the, adv the advance payment scheme for this, com this current financial year. Obviously, this will be dependent entirely on the number of applications that come forward, and we will continue to monitor that. And, and if there is a requirement for us to put additional resources into the payment of uh, payments in accordance with the advanced payment scheme during this financial year, uh, I am committed to doing exactly that. John Mason. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary said in his statement that concerning the statutory scheme there would be full pre-legislative consultation. I wonder if he can say anything about how he will encourage survivors to take part in that. Deputy First Minister. We've, we've benefited enormously over the course of the last few years from the participation of survivors 
in the interaction review process. Uh, I, I, I cannot express adequately my admiration for the individuals who have made this contribution because they have had to deal with the horror of their own experience, but they have deployed that for the benefit of others in our society. And I cannot possibly express my admiration for these individuals adequately. Um, so we will continue in that spirit. Uh, our policy making has been enhanced by the dialogue with that group and I intend to make sure that is central. Uh, the, the interaction review group is central to how we engage with survivors in the design of the statutory scheme.